네, 안녕하세요. 반갑습니다. Uh, well, welcome to this session. And uh, 사실은 민주주의 원칙에 따르면 더보다 많은 분들이 친숙한 언어로 확인해야 되는데 그렇게 되면 한국어인데 근데 이 어, 연사들 중에는 외국인이 더 많으신 것 같아요. 그래서 진행을 영어로 하도록 하겠습니다. 어, 이해해 주시기 바랍니다. According to the theory of democracy, we have to use the language most <laughs> used by the audience, but since our uh, distinguished panels are more international, more non-Korean than Korean, let me use English uh, to uh, present this session. Well. Well, uh, we have 90 minutes, and my sacred role is to make sure that uh, we finish this session in 90 minutes. And I've asked each of these uh, four distinguished members to spend 15 minutes in their presentations, and then altogether we'll have 60 minutes to be spent by four panel members, and then we'll have roughly 20 to 30 minutes for uh, Q&A, and I understand that you have ways to uh, bring to the session the questions or comments that you may have uh, through this internet, and uh, I will be able to see what you will be addressing uh, to these panel members. So please make sure to use this machine to uh, show your concerns, your comments, and so on. So today, the session is about change in future society and universal innovation. I believe that the change is taking place 5,000 years ago, today, and tomorrow, 5,000 years later. So change is not uncommon, but since we live the time today, the changes taking place today are as important as others and more important. Uh, especially in education, because education is a kind of a link pin between people and the future. And we have four uh, distinguished panel members, or each of which, each of whom is representing uh, various parts of uh, the world through university. So let me have the pleasure of inviting these four uh, presenters uh, to. Uh, present their views on how the universities should be innovating in their countries as well as all over the world. So let me uh, have the honor of introducing the first presenter, uh, Principal and Vice Chancellor of McKinley University, Suzanne Fortier. Merci. Would you please? Thank you. Thank you. Bonjour à vous tous. Uh, good afternoon. It's a real pleasure to be here. It's my first visit to Korea, so merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. I've had the great opportunity over the last several years uh, to attend the World Economic Forum meetings in Davos, and so I've had many, many conversations about the fourth industrial revolution. And of course, uh, that has triggered for me uh, important questions about the changing roles of universities in this environment. Of course, we know the fourth industrial revolution is not in the future, it's with us today. We see it every day in our lives with many disruptive technologies increasingly being part of how we live, work, communicate with one another. AI, we hear about AI every day, we hear about drones, uh, of course, uh, blockchain, precision medicine, and many others. So this is very much part of our lives. And these so-called disruptive technologies are not only disrupting markets, they're having profound disruptions into the social fabric of our society. I think it is fair to say that we are not well prepared for these disruptions. If you think of the various uh, tools that we would need 
uh, regulations for how drones are circulating in the airspace, governmental structure, governance structure, uh, ethical consideration, uh, so that we can sh make sure that these uh, technologies have a positive impact on our lives. We are way behind. We are not well prepared, and uh, we're seeing it in particular, I think, in the impacts of these technologies in the workforce. We had several. Uh, already presentations this morning that talk about the disruptions in the workforce. And what we're seeing, certainly in Canada and many other parts of the world, is two things that are at the opposite end of the spectrum. One is that we have many, many positions that are now not filled. We can't find people with the talent we need. At the other end of the spectrum, many jobs disappearing. Uh, or being so transformed that people are losing uh, their ways to earn a living and it's causing major problems and increasing discrepancy of wealth all over the world. So let me share with you a few numbers because I think they're quite telling. These were shared by the World Economic Forum at their summer Davos meeting in September. So right now, 71% of the tasks are done by human, 29% by machines. Now, what is projected is that in four years from now, not in 20 years, four years, these numbers will change to 58% by human, 42 by machine. Also predicted that 55% of people will need to upskill or reskill. And I think the important number here is four. This is in four years from now. This is a very quick, fast pace of change that we're seeing right now. We know that the changes are not distributed evenly uh, in, in all of the s different segments of society. We also know that new jobs are being created, and these are ones that require distinctly human skills, creativity, cultural awareness, ethical judgment, emotional intelligence. These are part of the new jobs that we need, the kind of uh, skills or the kind of attributes that we will need to fill those new jobs. Now, in Canadian universities, of course, and I would say as in every university around the world, that has led us to ask ourselves some very important questions, and I mentioned three. How can we prepare the current and next generations of students for the jobs of the future, jobs that we cannot even anticipate right now. How do we ensure that our learning environment can reach people who have not in the past been able to participate in higher education? And the third question, how do we provide the means for people already in the workforce to reskill or upskill so that they can maintain their jobs? Now, there's a more profound question, I believe, and that is about our role. You know, the great things about universities in the last century is that we have been able to play a role in providing people, individuals, an opportunity to climb the social and economic ladder. Very important role. <coughs> now, our role as motors of social inclusion, I would say, has never been more important than it is today but never been more complex, as we see that these opportunities are not <coughs> available to everybody, and we need to make sure that we can make them available. When I think of career path, and the career paths in the 20th century, the climbing the social and economic ladder, it was a nice model. I think of it today, the picture that I have in mind is the game of snakes and ladders. So you might climb the ladder, but you never know when that snake will be there and make you fall right to where you are as a successful person professionally to having to start all over again at the bottom. And so these are the sort of things that we need to think about. Of course, we can take advantage of these technologies that are available to us and taking advantage of them to make much more flexible and adaptable way of learning for people particularly for new learners who have not in the past been able to participate. We need to contextualize learning models for them, make sure that we think of their 
own ways of learning so that we can help them find their path through the learning uh, careers. For people in the workplace, we have all sorts <coughs> of new models that are being adopted in every university. Hybrid learning, nano degrees, stackable certificates, very targeted programs to provide a person additional skills, additional competencies. And these are now part of the offerings of, I think, all universities. The one thing we know also is that there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all. But this is one of the advantages, I think, of the new technologies that are available to us. We are much better equipped now to customize learning for different people in different situations <coughs> and with different learning styles. But not all of it is about technology. And I'll mention one example from my university. Uh, that I think is, a, is a, a great way to bring education to communities that in the past could not take advantage of it. We have built <coughs> programs in the, our Faculty of Education, so Bachelor of Education, in partnerships with indigenous communities in Canada. And we are working with them, delivering the program in their communities. And also having a program that includes indigenous culture, indigenous languages, so that it is to the benefit of their community and the benefit of preserving their culture. So this is, I think, to me, a great example on how we need to bring the higher education to a much larger group of people and particularly those who were not able to benefit from it in the past. Now, I'll turn for the last uh, six minutes or so to what I think is a very important question is, how can we prepare the current and next <coughs> generation of students for the jobs of the future? Jobs uh, that may not be uh, even able, we're not even able to anticipate today. I think the one thing that we know is that we have to make sure that we equip our students to be both job ready and future ready. Because as we heard this morning, the projection is that they're going to live a long life uh, probably till 100 year old. Uh, they might have a job when they graduate. They'll have a different one five years from now, 10 years, 15, 50 years. And so we must make sure that we prepare them for the future. I think in terms of job ready, the sort of things that we're doing in Canada is giving our students an opportunity to practice what they learn in our universities right away. We call it work integrated learning. And we have a great project that uh, university leaders with uh, the business leaders have built together. And the goal of our project is to give every single student an opportunity to have such an experience in the workplace. Uh, we also need to provide an environment to our students where it can their sharpen their leadership skills, their entrepreneurial skills, and that they can do that both in social innovation, in technology innovation. Uh, great uh, members of our extended community of alumni are coming to uh, uh, work with us in this area, being mentors, being part of networks so that the students uh, can integrate that world uh, with uh, people who've traveled the path before. And also we need to engage our students globally, giving them the opportunity to uh, be outside of our, uh, their own environment, so to have global internships, to have study abroad, cultural exchanges. I think that very important for our students to be future ready is to engage them in deep learning. To me, that means learning that stimulates them to challenge assumptions, to ask very tough questions, uh, learning that uh, nurture their creativity, their analytical skills. And we must do that in every area. If you uh, recall what I was mentioned about the fourth industrial revolution, the biggest problems, in fact, are in policy, are in uh, philosophy, ethics, and so on. So we need to make sure that we have people who are well prepared for uh, asking those deep questions and having the ability to uh, explore at a very deep level. <coughs> of course, we know lifelong learning will be part of our students' life 
as they need to constantly readapt to a changing world. So I think perhaps one of the most important thing is learning how to learn. I would end with what I think is what I would like to see every student leaving McGill University, what I'd like them to leave with. Most important thing for me is that when they leave our university, they discover their great capacity for learning. They have confidence. They have confidence that no matter what is being presented to them, no matter what challenge they'll be seeing in the future, they'll be ready for it because they know that they can learn. Great. Merci. Thank you for emphasizing the capacity for learning. Great, thank you. Now, let me um, have the pleasure of in, uh, introducing and inviting uh, President David Rose, uh, School of Visual Art. Please, be, please note that he has been president of the university for 40 years. Please. Thank you. Yes. Probably way too long, uh, but... You must have a world record. Uh, no, I don't. Really? Um, uh, the president of Bard has been president longer than I, mm. uh, Leon Botstein. And he was actually president of a college when he was 26. I was 32, so mm. he's got some time on me. Oh, wow. oh also, he's older. Yeah. Um, this morning, uh, Former Prime Minister Reinfeldt uh, said he was optimistic, cautiously optimistic, but optimistic. I am uh, cautiously pessimistic uh, about the university system of the United States uh, and its ability to lead uh, what has been called the fourth industrial revolution or even be a serious part of it with certain minor exceptions of three or four universities. Um, American universities, and the problems are both political and structural. American universities prize institutional autonomy. Uh, universities seem to believe that as long as they are not interfered with, they will continue to innovate and serve the needs of the country. But autonomy requires that sources of revenue that sustain the university should remain uninterrupted. To ensure a continuous and steady flow of tuition revenue, universities seek to become selective. Having more, or in some cases, many more applicants than places, insulates the university from outside pressures to a great extent. But selectivity necessarily entails exclusion. It is the tension between exclusion and inclusion that has led to some of the most important innovations in American higher education. The United States' oldest colleges, Harvard, William and Mary, St. John's, and Yale, all began as institutions dedicated to the education of the next generation of lawyers and clergymen. Apparently at the time, these were the only two professions with sufficient stature to merit a college education. The curricula consisted largely of reading the classics in the original Greek and Latin, the experimental sciences were active, uh, absent from the curricula, as was medicine. This focus of the American uni University remained unchanged until the Morrell Act of 1862. During the United States Civil War, Congress has awarded tracts of land to be auctioned off to for the benefit of institutions that would teach the agriculture and the mechanic arts. Some states matched the federal uh, gifts with donations of their own. In addition to what we now call the federal land-grant universities of the Midwest and the West, such as University of Illinois, University of Minnesota, University of Wisconsin, there were some surprising beneficiaries, Cornell University and MIT. The act was a radical innovation in American higher education in at least three ways. First, it involved the federal government in higher education despite the federal government having no constitutional role. Second, it encouraged people who would not normally have considered college to attend. 
But perhaps most importantly, it introduced subjects that were eminently practical into the college curriculum. Prior to the Morrell Act, all engineers were educated at the military academies. Afterwards, most were educated at land-grant colleges. Uh, as a result of this educational intervention and the later addition of farm extension programs attached to the land-grant universities, the percentage of the labor force devoted to farming dropped from 58% in 1860 to 38% in 1900, <coughs> and it's now one and a half percent. The next significant federal intervention was the Servicemen's Readjustment Act of 1944, commonly known as the GI Bill. Uh, the GI Bill extended college education to people who never had an idea that it would happen. Uh, it was out of reach to them. Uh, the idea was not universally popular, in December of 1944, University of Chicago President John Maynard Hutchins remarked, college and universities will find themselves converted into intellectual hobo jungles, and veterans unable to get work and equally unable to resist putting pressure on colleges and universities will find, <coughs> find themselves educational hobos. Pretty strong stuff. Despite his misgivings, University of Chicago enrolled veterans. Giving up football was much easier than foregoing federal money. By 1947, half of all college students were veterans. These were the first truly untraditional students. The state of California, under the leadership of Clark Kerr, offered a plan for higher education in 1960. California's plan became the blueprint for higher education for the rest of the country. Essentially, the plan was designed to prepare for the large generation, my generation, born after 1945, that was beginning to come of age. It was clear that resources, both human and physical, would have to be marshaled for the, largest then, the then largest birth cohort in the history of the United States. What was radical about the California plan was it guaranteed, guaranteed, a place in the system for every Californian who could benefit from education or training. In short, everyone who graduated from high school was welcome somewhere in the California system, and at that time, for free. The key to open admissions was the community college system. With its dual mandate, preparing students to transfer to four-year institutions or training them for the labor force. The California plan was soon replicated in New York State, although not the for free part. Most of the other states have followed this example. The era of mass higher education had begun in a deliberate way. In, 19, in 1965, there were nearly six million students enrolled in college. By 1980, that number had doubled to 12 million. Today, it stands at almost 20 million. Another way to think about this expansion is to note that the percentage of the population in college has increased from 3.3% to 6.8%. I think it only fair to add that South Korea has achieved the California dream of almost 100% completion of some form of tertiary education. There is much we can learn from you and your success. Um, there are a number of reasons that are offered for this uh, increase in college going rates. Uh, there, are no, there are more non-traditional students, there are increased birth cohorts. But the fourth and most important reason uh, is the increase in the college going rate, especially of women. In 1960, approximately 54% of male high school graduates enrolled in college directly while only 37.5% of women did. By 1988, the college going rate for women was 60.8%, and by 1997, it was over 70%. What has happened since 1960 is that a system that was predominantly male has been transformed into one that is now predominantly female. 
in 2015, 56% of all college students were female. The incoming classes in the professions of law and medicine that year uh, that had overwhelmingly been male were now majority female. Uh, when Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg enrolled in Harvard Law, she was one of eight women in a class of 500 and was told she was taking the place of a deserving man. This is selectivity morphing into bigotry. One of the reasons for the increase in women in higher education is that selective all-male colleges, Yale, Princeton, for example, began to admit women in 1969. Harvard, the old one, couldn't get it done until 1977. Women who had been excluded were now recruited. After a flurry of building in the 70s and 80s, the physical growth of higher education institutions, particularly public institutions, was curtailed. By 1980, public support, both monetary and moral, for the concept of inclusion had begun to wane. There were concerns that too many Americans were going to college. Of course, those concerns were always voiced by those who had already finished college. Enrollments, however, continued to increase. Resources were constrained and often falling. States were building prisons rather than classrooms. Colleges began to look for other ways to serve populations that did not strain physical resources. Chief among these efforts were branch campuses, extension centers, and sites. With main campuses at capacity, the only way to, be, uh, to continue to expand was by building off-campus sites. And then DARPAnet morphed into the internet. Entrepreneurial institutions sensed that by combining the personal computer and the internet, higher education could be offered to even larger numbers of eager students without straining the physical resources of the main campus. Online education was begun. The early efforts were promising, but were constrained by federal regulations. For each course offered online, the university had to offer another different course on the ground so that no more than 50% of courses offered by an institution were offered online. 50% rule was repealed in 2006, ushering in the era of the completely online university. The outcomes, however, of those enrolled online were not particularly heartening. Graduation rates were extremely low, quality was often poor, and some institutions violated the law in attempts to increase enrollment. Um, the next iteration of online education was the massive online open course, or MOOC. MOOCs were justified by touting their low cost and their ability to serve underserved populations. Unfortunately, analysis seems to indicate that MOOCs have worse outcomes than traditional online courses. MOOCs have a course completion rate of less than 7% per course. If these numbers are accurate, for every 10,000 students who enroll, only three will complete as few as three consecutive courses. A Harvard-MIT study claimed that only 3% of the enrollees were from underserved populations. 65% had already had a bachelor's degree. The, some of the more recent attempts to innovate both on the ground and on the internet is what have been called competency-based education and its non-degree facsimile competency badges. Here again, innovation, if it is innovation, has been constrained by government regulation. Um, in a complex society, an educational credential functions in a number of different ways, depending upon who's evaluating the credential. One of these ways is to differentiate the holder of the credential from those who do not hold the credential. So those holding a bachelor's degree are placed higher in the labor queue than those holding an associate's degree, who are generally placed higher in the queue than those who have a high school diploma and perhaps some competency badges. This is a function of the way HR works. The labor queue is further stratified by the perception of whether or not the credential is from an elite or non-elite institution. 
In the short term, innovations that do not consider this labor market search mechanism will not succeed, or will succeed only to the extent that the holders of the less prestigious credentials are willing to work for less money. In the United States, educational quality is often conflated, conflated with selectivity. The more selective a university, the more prestigious the credential. This is the essence of the tension between exclusivity and inclusion. The recent attempts at innovation that chiefly use the internet as a means of delivery will have to overcome their perceived inferiority. Even when selective institutions participate in these innovations, such as those offering courses through Udacity, Coursera, or edX, they are careful to differentiate their online content from their primary mission so as not to undermine the luster of their traditional higher education offerings. Clearly, to move further towards inclusion will require a sustained financial commitment on the part of the federal government and state governments. Uh, that commitment by in incentivizing universities uh, does not seem, the political will to make that kind of commitment does, does not seem to be at hand and has not for the last almost 50 years. Um, it requires direction from the top, uh, incentives from the top, to reshape the landscape of higher education in the United States as the government did in 1862, 1944, and again in 1960. Real innovation needs financial inducements that will overcome the inertia of institutional autonomy of the American university. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you for the presentation. And let us move to the third presenter, uh, Professor Christopher Moresci, who is the Vice Pro Provost, Trinity College, Dublin, Ireland. So now we are moving the content from America to Europe. Thank you very much. Please. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Right, thanks very much. Um, I suppose what I want to do, I want to talk a little bit about, obviously, universities in Europe, but I also want to interrogate this concept of the fourth industrial revolution as something which is, I suppose it's not a thing, it's a concept with a certain explanatory power. And it's probably, there's the slides, and it's probably worth reminding ourselves, sorry, can I just ask, how do I, how do I advance these? There's a, is there a clicker for these? I got a, is there a technical person around? Maybe it just, Right in front of you. Oh, this here. Yeah. yeah, got it. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Ah, there we are. Good. There. We have technology working. It's worth reminding ourselves, and if we're talking about the idea of the fourth industrial revolution, what we're talking about, we're talking about something that comes after three other industrial revolutions. The first, which is roughly the industrial revolution of steam. The second, which is characterized by manufacturing. And the third, which is basically the first stage of computerization. What do each of these have in common? Well, they have a number of things in common, but one of the things that they all have in common is they all involve technologies. They're all defined by particular technologies, and those technologies all, to some extent, arose in universities. The second thing that these concepts that underlie our notion of the fourth industrial revolution have in common is that they haven't gone away. We may not use steam very much anymore, but we still augment human power as much as we possibly can. We still use manufacturing, um, uh, mass manufacturing techniques, and we still, God knows, we use computers. So when we talk about the fourth industrial revolution, it is not as if we are in some place that is completely other than the past. It is we are in a period in which the past is there in a kind of sedimentary form. So I just want to keep those two ideas in mind because I want to float an idea that we can layer on to the idea of the fourth industrial revolution in terms of thinking about universities. And that's, if we 
take, say, this idea of the fourth industrial revolution as first of all being characterized, and this is Klaus Schwab at the World Economic Forum, characterized by much more ubiquitous and mobile internet, by smaller and more powerful sensors that have become cheaper, and by artificial intelligence and machine learning. And he goes on to say the fourth industrial revolution is fundamentally changing the way we live, work, and relate to one another in its scale, scope, and complexity. What I consider to be the fourth industrial revolution is unlike anything that mankind has experienced before. Neither one of those definitions is terribly useful to me because in some ways this tells me what the technologies are that enable the fourth industrial revolution and the other piece of it simply says this is bigger, this is different than anything that we've experienced before. So I want to ask how do we think about universities in this context? Well I want to make a suggestion. I think we can look at four ages of the university, and I'm saying this very much from a European perspective because, of course, the oldest universities are European. It's the University of Bologna, it's the oldest in the world, dates from 1088. And in the centuries that follow, we have universities growing up around medieval Europe. Oxford, 1096, Salamanca, 1134, Paris, 1160, Cambridge, 1206. My own university, Trinity College Dublin, is a relative latecomer in this stakes. It's, it's founded in 1592. It comes at the end of what I would call the first age of the university, which is the medieval university. And the prime function of the, med of the university in this period is really the stewardship of scholarship. It's maintaining scholarship and passing it on to another generation of scholars. <coughs> this is succeeded by what I would call the second age of the university, the professional university, which really, I mean, I would, as a starting point, I would say the founding of the law school in Edinburgh in 1707 is really when you start to get the beginnings of what I would call the professional university. But this would include things like the founding of the world's first business school, ESCP Paris in 1819, um, the techno te technological universities of the 19th century, ETH Zurich, 1855, Technical University of Berlin, 1879. And the function of the professional university is to train professionals, lawyers, doctors, engineers. And of course, I mean, they did teach things like law and medicine in the older universities, but this was really the primary function of what these universities were founded for. This period, I would say, goes on until effectively World War II. There's a fundamental change after World War II. In the UK, for instance, between 1945 and 1951, the number of people in third level increased by 70%, from 50,000 to 84,000. There was a great wave of what the polytechnical universities in the UK and comparable institutions in Germany, in France, and right across Europe. These universities, these institutions were founded in order to democratize learning in the interests of social cohesion and equality of opportunity. So where are we now? I call this the global university, but it might not be the right term. It's the fourth age of the university. We still have stewardship of scholarship. We still have stewardship of information. But in a period in which there are nomadic flows of information, the idea of a university as a center for gathering scholarship seems a bit archaic. Likewise, the professionals that we train are rapidly being supplanted by machines, as we've already heard. We're not too far away from the first robotic pharmacist. We can do medical diagnosis by robot. A lot of, of legal tasks are done by machine. Accountancy is increasingly done by machine. So a lot of these things that we train our professionals for are being overtaken by machines. And I think in terms of the egalitarian university of raising all boats, we know that the kinds of threats to jobs that we're hearing about in terms of the fourth industrial revolution is going to challenge that in a lot of ways. So there's a sense in which we can say in this fourth industrial revolution, the fourth age of the university is one in which we have been disrupted. But let's think about this for a moment. We may have been disrupted, but we are also the disruptors. I go back to Klaus Schwab and the characteristics of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. And he picks out a number of what he calls megatrends, technologies that are doing the disrupting. He pull, picks on three in particular. He picks on 3D printing, nanoscience, and the Internet of Things. 
Now, I just looked around my own university. I could look around any university, but I look around my own university. This is my colleague, Johnny Coleman. He's the adult who's a nanoscientist who works with a material called graphene, a two-dimensional material called graphene, which is a, a superconductor. So you can produce these amazing kind of superconductive things that are microscopic. He has it there in children's Play-Doh. He uses it to demonstrate how you can make body sensors by putting it in children's Play-Doh. 3D printing. This is the work of a friend of a colleague of mine, a bioengineer named, um, uh, named Danny, um, Danny Kelly, just blanked on his name for a moment, who uses 3D printers to print bones, human bones, which are implanted in the body and actually function like bones. And then this picture down here is just Dublin. This is based on the work of a colleague of mine, Linda Doyle, who uses these multiplicity of sensors in order to work on smart cities. So I only need to look around my own campus and I can see how the disruptions, these things that are disrupting the university, are actually being produced by the university. They're coming from within the university. Now this has led me to think about the work of another colleague of mine, an astrophysicist, a man named Peter Gallagher. And he's also interested in the history of astrophysics. This was what was once the largest telescope in the world. It was in Ireland, in the grounds of a castle, Burr Castle. It was called the Leviathan. And for 75 years, from 1845 until almost 1920, it was the biggest telescope in the world. 16-meter tube, two-meter diameter. It was the biggest telescope in the world until somebody built a bigger one. Because in the age of the Second Industrial Revolution and the Third Industrial Revolution, things got bigger by getting bigger. If that doesn't sound too silly, that you made something bigger by making something that was bigger again. This is the telescope that Peter Gallagher works with today. It's now one of the biggest in the world. It's not the size of a house like the Leviathan, it's the size of a continent. This is LOFAR, which is a radio telescope, and it's made up of a series of things like the little picture in the top corner. See that black thing that looks like a patio? It's a whole series of radio telescopes networked around Europe. In the age of the Fourth Industrial Revolution, things don't get bigger by getting bigger. They get bigger by getting connected, by getting networked. And that should give us a hint as to what universities looked like in the age of the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Any of us here associated with universities could draw maps like this, and I happen to pick this one because it looks like the LOFAR map. This is the League of European Research Universities, which my university is a member of. All of our universities, I think, could draw similar maps of networks of universities with which we're involved. In the research field in particular, in Europe, this kind of networking is absolutely important because the major source of research funding is the European Research Council. Its budget for the next number of years, between, well, between 2014 and 2020, will run to 13 billion euros. So if you want to do research, you need to be networked. Likewise with teaching. I think all of us are beginning to become networked, become involved with other universities. In Europe, this has taken a step forward over the last year with the declaration that was made last December, and I shouldn't read this, where there was a declaration to involves strengthening strategic partnerships across the EU between higher education institutions and encouraging the emergence by 2024 of some 20 European universities. This is the idea of universities of Europe, that would be networked universities, consisting of bottom-up networks of universities across the EU, which will enable students to obtain a degree by combining studies in several EU countries and contribute to the international competitiveness of European universities. So let's put these two things together. If we're looking at a fourth industrial revolution, where, as recent OECD report puts it, we need to be, start to connect more with industry, how, what does this look like in terms of teaching? Well, this is my own university, is in the process of building, now there's what I want, is building an innovation district. It's the little um, light bulb there in the middle which is in an area that is surrounded by a whole series of tech industries. You see the logos there for Facebook, for Uber, for Stripe, for a whole Google, for a whole series of industries. 
What we are building there is, is, is basically a kind of innovation hub where we have labs, where we have venture capitalists, where we have spin-out companies, we have the highest rate of student entrepreneurship in Europe already, and developing that and linking that to a new kind of learning space where we can do experiential and group learning that ties into this kind of innovation, this kind of connection with industry. That's one thing. The other thing, however, though, we need to, I think, really think about is that if, as this OECD report puts it, the future is uncertain and we cannot predict it, but we need to be open and ready for it, and other speakers have already alluded to this, for jobs that have not been created, for technologies that have not been invented to solve problems that have not been anticipated, if that's the future we're looking at, then we need to think Along the lines of Joseph Owen, and I find his book here, Robot Proof, to be really uh, influential in my thinking about this, that in the age where machines can do the jobs of people better and better than people can, we need a number of competencies. And he refers to these as technological literacy, data literacy, but the one I want to focus on here in the last couple of minutes is what he calls human literacy. Even in the robot age, he writes, or perhaps especially in the robot age, what matters is other people. Human literacy equips us for the social milieu, giving us power to communicate, engage with others, and tap into our human capacity for grace and beauty. It encompasses the humanities traditionally found in liberal arts education, but includes elements of the arts. This is the kind of thing you can do in universities that are not huge. And it goes back to this idea of what is the optimum size for a university. In a world of connected networks, a university of maybe 20,000 can perhaps produce this kind of human interaction in a different way than a university that feels it has to grow and grow and grow. If we grow through being networked as opposed to simply getting bigger, we have perhaps a better chance of doing this. In my own university, we've tried to define what it is we want our students to have. And it was interesting this morning, Jessica Neal used the word attributes. The one thing we say that we want <clears throat> from our students when they graduate, as well as a competency in whether it's nanoscience or history or business or accounting, whatever it is they happen to study, we want them to be able to act responsibly, to think independently, to develop continuously, and to communicate effectively. And we're building, we're redesigning our entire undergraduate curriculum around these principles. So, to wrap it up, what does it mean then to think about the university in the age of the fourth industrial revolution, to think of the fourth age of the university? I think we have to recognize that like the fourth industrial revolution, the fourth age of the university also contains within it the traces of its earlier periods, of the scholarly, professional, and egalitarian ages. I think we have to recognize that that relationship between research and teaching needs to become more intimate and, more, and rethought in lots of ways, because research is where the disruption is coming from, and we need to embrace that into our teaching. Networked universities are the universities for a networked world, and ultimately what our aim is, is graduates who are robot-proof. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our final, but not the least, President M.J. Ho of Korea University. Please. Okay, good afternoon, every, everybody. Um, it is my pleasure and honor uh, to share our experience in Korea University. Uh, last four years, we have experimented a number of uh, just like uh, uh, future innovation of education in the 21st century. So uh, let me introduce some of our yeah, experiences in the fourth industrial revolution in higher education. Okay, how do we understand the development of, development of human civilization? And you can see that, for example, the Ray Kurzweil mentioned that around 2045, uh, just like uh, around 20 or 30 years later, we will just face a new uh, humankind combined with uh, machines, 
and uh, just like uh, yeah, DNA based the human body. So, as previous yeah, presenters, speakers already mentioned that uh, fourth uh, industrial revolution, we started from the uh, 18th century industrial revolution and uh, mass production dominates the 20th century, uh, our job and work and everything. So in the 20th century, you know that uh, uh, big companies and the mass production and automation is a very common uh, just uh, uh, aspect of human civilization. But in the uh, late 1960s or 1970s, uh, we have uh, uh, just the invention of computer and computer just, a, uh, just a, yeah, come into our human lives and then in the 21st century we are moving into the networked and the knowledge information society. And the, what are the current realities in higher education? This morning, uh, just uh, Vice Prime Minister Yu mentioned that the uh, Korean economy has grown last 50 years uh, just a, uh, on the average, world economy has grown around 6.6 .6 times bigger in the last 50 years. But in Korean economy, we have achieved 400 times bigger. So it is a marvelous, uh, unprecedented historical events. But uh, main uh, <coughs> elements and main reason is that uh, education, especially the higher education. But that kind of higher education still valid in the 21st century we just uh, yeah, have some kind of uh, question. And the Korean education system, just like a rote memorization and uh, uh, mass education, it is still valid in the 21st century. We have to just uh, think about it. For example, uh, in the 1980s, we've, we have only 11, just a uh, percent of our AZ groups uh, enter colleges, but now we just achieved the number one in the OECD countries, more than 70%. But uh, this kind of a standardized higher education and the root memorization is our strength in the 20th century. The explicit knowledge is very important for the mass production and big companies' uh, employment, <coughs> but in the 21st century, it is still valid or not. We have to think about it. For example, uh, you can understand, for example, Samuel Epsman recently just published a book in Harvard yeah, Researcher. He said that uh, around uh, half of the present knowledge is obsolete and extinct within uh, around 10 years. So still, we are just uh, yeah, conveying our knowledge to the students that is enough or not. We have to think about it. For example, uh, if you just uh, turn on the, uh, just like a smartphone and you can answer any question within uh, 10 or 20 seconds, you can just uh, find the information and the knowledge. So if we simply memorize the knowledge and information, it's still uh, just valid in the 21st century, it is not good. So I just make it, uh, the word uh, pioneering intellectual is more important than the excellent ship. And uh, we are competing with uh, not with the Seoul National University or Harvard or Stanford University. We are competing with, my university competing with, yeah, just like Microsoft or Google or Samsung or SK Groups. It means that, uh, for example, my university, we have around 2,000 uh, faculty members, but Samsung Electronics has alone, they have this more than 3,000 PhDs in the company. They're developing, they're creating knowledges. But Still, just like the 20th century, we are simply conveying our knowledge to the students. That is enough. I don't think it is not enough. And you see that in the Google campuses, they are doing their job at the moment, and not there just uh, yeah, relaxing. So the working uh, system is quite uh, differently changed, and we are not doing simply the mass production. In the mass production, uh, just like a system, we need uh, experts and uh, just the special knowledges. That is, we just call the explicit knowledge. But in the 21st century, we need the tacit knowledge uh, and the implicit knowledge is more important than the explicit knowledge. And many Korean students and college graduates are waiting for this kind of uh, 
uh, lining up the nice plane or the ships or the cruise boat or something like that. But uh, it does not exist anymore. And we have to just uh, sail by ourselves in the, to, into the ocean. And you know that the Silicon Valley, the spirit is the 49ers. And when I went to Stanford in 1980, I found that the Stanford, uh, just the uh, San Francisco football team's name is 49ers. But I, don't, I didn't know the meaning. But 49ers means that uh, 1849 gold rush, the, just like uh, wagons and the family, they just put their family together and uh, cross the uh, country. And then that kind of pioneership is a very, very important spirit in San Francisco. Now it appears in the Silicon Valley. Uh, they're uh, just uh, not worrying about failure and try and try it again. And uh, it is a very uh, global society and a new uh, just a, yeah, uh, ecosystem. Steve Jobs, he started his work in the Silicon Valley in the garage and uh, he just uh, uh, faced a number of failures, but he uh, just mentioned that it is very good uh, experience for him to just to challenge another step. The smartphone is the creation of the last part of his failure. So I just uh, changed my university into more creative one. So uh, later I just mentioned that uh, we just built the, uh, just the uh, pioneering villages and the Pieville and in the motto of the Pieville is the uh, imagination is more important than knowledge that is the yeah, world by uh, Albert Einstein. Uh, the reason is that knowledge is not enough in the 21st century, okay? So the key elements for the future leaders, expert, expertise is not enough. We, have, we need more uh, other elements is necessary in the 21st century. Then uh, where should the university in the 21st century go from here? I just want to say that this, we need to raise social innovators. Social innovators means that uh, uh, solve the, any problem uh, that is yeah, just faced to the students. For example, for the future leaders, uh, we don't simply convey our knowledge to the students, but strengthen our yeah, just the muscles of our yeah, creating knowledge. That is very important. Uh, just the element for the 21st century leaders. So we just uh, change our, uh, just like a lecture system into the flipped classes and the students uh, for the freshman year, from this year, we are just uh, making the uh, compulsory uh, courses that is yeah, made by the flipped classes. The students watch the video clips in advance and then uh, they are just uh, sending the questions to the professors and uh, mass this kind of lecture just for one hour and then it divided up 15 to 20 students and uh, uh, organized by the teaching fellow and they're discussing. And then finally, uh, five members of the students, they're just uh, presenting as a project. So we are using this kind of thing. So uh, a number of uh, ideas, courses should be changed into the lecture to the problem-based learning or project courses. So that is the reason uh, just that we are changing every system. In research, up until now, Korean uh, universities focused on the writing uh, scholarly papers, just like uh, SCI papers or something like that. But that is not enough. And uh, you know that the Korean, uh, in the world, Korea is number one in terms of the R&D investment. And we just, uh, yeah, uh, number two is Israel. Our four 0.29% of our GDP goes to research, R&D. And uh, our total amount of investment of R&D, we just uh, uh, surpassed the, uh, the UK uh, five years ago. We are number five in terms of the total R&D investment. But the effectiveness of the R&D, the knowledge creation is not enough because they are only focused on the writing papers. So the how to collaborate with the industry is very important and make it, make it more effective. So we are just uh, yeah, changing to in that way. Okay, I just focus on the yeah, pioneering intellectuals and innovation. And the first one is that three no policies that I just took. Uh, for example, still the Ministry of Education asked us to check the attendance. 
but I just uh, yeah, get rid of these kind of things. And the no, just the, like uh, uh, the comparative assessment, no uh, proctor exam. And, and also the academic semesters, usually we, for one course, three hours a week and the 16 weeks is the very common one. It existed from the 1960s and 70s but up until now. But now our courses changed into the project courses. So I just changed it into eight weeks. If you just teach uh, six uh, hours per week, then it is enough. So the school starts, uh, the semester just ends very quickly. And then we just send our professors and students to the foreign countries as an internship or something like that. And the reform of scholarship, we just uh, provide a scholarship for the uh, students who get a higher grade. But I just changed it into, it is, not, it is simply just like a pocket money, or they are just wasting their money to purchase the smartphones or just the drinking or something like this. So I just change it, uh, just abolish any that kind of merit-based scholarship. And then we are sending program-based one. We are sending our students, for example, 100 students for uh, China to take intensive courses of Chinese language and the 45 students to Costa Rica and Mexico uh, to learn the Spanish, and the 25 students to Japan, and the eight weeks in the vacation, and the, around the 15 hours uh, they study in a day. So, the, for example, one student who couldn't speak any Chinese languages, and after eight weeks, he just uh, spoke uh, without any script and five minute speeches in uh, Chinese. So that kind of thing we are just uh, making in that way. Okay, I'm just running out of time and I'm just moving forward. Innovation in research, we are doing the, we are selecting 100 uh, just the crimson enterprises. It means that crimson is our yeah, university color. So, and also the global industries, we are just making this kind of uh, collaboration. And uh, this kind of uh, planning, research planning, uh, I just uh, yeah, set up the Office of Research Planning and then within four years, we have achieved uh, 100 uh, million US dollars increase of the R&D uh, just a yeah, fund from the government toward the companies. And uh, at the moment, we have 34 and 40 uh, companies are selected. And this one is Pi Pioneer Village is the, uh, in, in Korea, we don't have many garage, just like uh, Steve Jobs started. So I just uh, yeah, purchased 38 uh, container boxes, used container boxes, and I just made it colored. And then this one is a Pieville. In here, students just uh, yeah, talk and discuss. It's not a startup company, but just like uh, ideas. And uh, no groups uh, just occupy the whole, uh, just a period of semester, and simply uh, one month or something like that. Around the 60 groups already uh, just uh, participated in this program, and then uh, we are developing that kind of things. And, and also the uh, X garage, that is, students can just uh, make something, and uh, uh, 3D printers and that kind of things uh, here uh, in this way. For example, the SK Future Hall is a new one. It is around uh, 80, 80 million uh, US dollars building, and it is a seven story building, but it doesn't have any classroom. It has around 111 just a yeah, discussion room and the 111 curl and living lab and uh, just like a food court or something like that. And 24 hours, and it is a totally uh, just like uh, IT based, yeah, just a yeah, just discussion rooms. And the CZ Creator Library. Uh, thanks to the CZ Group's donation, and library changed into the studios, and students can just uh, yeah, make their own YouTubes here, and uh, there are six studios in there, and uh, TED uh, stages or something like that. Okay, and, and also the students uh, just uh, participate in the responsibility, as you already mentioned. And finally, I just want to say that uh, university is no, should not be uh, just like uh, knowledge transmitting uh, places. And uh, in Korean students, uh, just uh, yet learning and uh, studying is just like uh, they think that it is uh, uh, labor, hard work. But learning, is from, yeah, learning comes from the curiosity. 
So I just changed my university and campuses from the learning places to the knowledge amusement park and the playground, just cafe and uh, studios. And uh, as I just showed that before, uh, Pieville, that kind of playground is more important in the 21st century. Okay, Korea, Korea University started very late in 1905, and then uh, at the time, to save the nation through education is our uh, motto, just to be for five years before the Japanese colonization. So uh, we are just uh, uh, facing this kind of a new challenge of the fourth industrial revolution, and we are innovate our universal system into a new one just for the 21st century. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, we just listened to five interesting stories from five different corners of the world. <laughs> Two from America, one, uh, and one from Europe, and one from Korea. Uh, I didn't do it, but it seems to me that uh, the future is more diverse mm -hmm. than we imagined from what these four uh, presenters said, from rather cautiously pessimistic view to quite optimistic mm -hmm. and uh, future-oriented views. And uh, rather than <coughs> uh, sort of summarizing them, uh, let me have time. Now we have about 24 minutes. Uh, ask the questions that you had already ra uh, raised through this machine. Ah. And, oops. There are some questions with many uh, yeses. And <laughs> I'll start with the ones with many yeses. And let me see. The question is, online education is spreading very rapidly, threatening traditional way of teaching. In the future, number one, should professors change their way of teaching and research in the wake of this change? Number two, you. can universities continue to charge a raised tuition uh, with the current system? In other words, uh -huh. uh, <coughs> is, it, is it right for universities to charge mm -hmm. money with the education system that is antiquated, <laughs> <laughs> right? So who will answer this question? Yes. Uh, um, I would suggest that it um, depends on how well the person teaches. Mm -hmm. uh, if the person is an inspiring teacher, they should continue to be an inspiring teacher. And that probably means meeting face to face. Mm -hmm. Um, so I recently read a, an article in the Chronicle of Higher Education about how um, uh, a, one university was trying to use uh, artificial intelligence uh, to grade papers in a lecture class of 500. Uh, so they were giving you a simulacrum of being in front of a professor. And ultimately, I don't think that quite works. Uh, you actually need to be there. Uh, and one of the things that's most important that shouldn't be missed is student motivation. And it's really hard to be motivated by a robot. Mm -hmm. You tend to be motivated by people and people who have an interest in you uh, and that you have an interest in. Um, that's one. So I think you keep doing the same thing. I don't think everyone goes online. Second thing is, this is one of the problems, tuition uh, is one of the problems in the United States. Uh, we have seen tuition rise at a much faster level than the rate of inflation, and more importantly, at a much faster level than the increase in the median income. Um, ultimately, at some point, there will be, that model will cease to function. Um, uh, when, I don't know when that happens, but it will cease, cease to function because anything that can't go on forever will, will stop. And so that will, when that happens, I don't exactly know what will happen, but uh, uh, my chart, about a quarter of the people enrolled in American higher education are in private institutions where tuition has really skyrocketed. 
uh, because they don't receive, those institutions don't receive adequate public support to keep the tuition down. If the government chooses to invest in ways to do that, um, then the tuition will fall or it'll be provided for by the government as it was with the veterans in 1945 or 46 when their entire tuition bill plus the living stipend was covered by the government. So your answer to the second question is no, it won't go up as much as... <laughs> no, it'll keep going up until it's mm. sudden stop. It's a sudden plateau. Yeah. All right, well, uh, pr President Suzanne put here. Well, on the first question, should professors change? Well, they're changing. So already, it's, they're changing. They're changing already. They're using all of the new uh, tools for learning and integrating them in their way of teaching. And so what we're seeing is a much more uh, rich environment for learning because there's all sorts of tools. For example, uh, we have professors who have done MOOCs and they're using the MOOCs as part of teaching in real life on campus as well. So it's, uh, it's already happening. On the question of fees, there are uh, needs for certain learners of very specific content, and those are available at very modest price. So if all you want is a macro degree in something, uh, this is available, it's not very expensive, and the price is very much aligned with uh, what it is that you want and the content. But when we're thinking of the court of students at a younger age who are coming to our universities, that's not the only thing they want, is content. They also want a full experience in their years on campuses. And uh, that's what they will pay for, not just the little uh, content part. And that experience is one that we uh, need to create for our students with a lot more than just what's happening in the classroom. Now, in Canada, uh, we still have very modest prices for education. At my own university, for a student who is uh, from the province where we're located, the tuition fees are $2,500 a year. Often my American colleague asks me if this is for a month. No, it's for a year, so it's very modest still, and that is because we view accessibility to university education as a real value uh, in our society. Okay, good. Would you like to add something, please? Yeah, I, I think one thing I would say about um, learning technologies is we have to be careful not to just use them because they're there. That just because they're new doesn't necessarily mean they're better. It's a case of looking at what is appropriate to a particular learning situation. So there are some kinds of teaching, say very informationally dense things, where the sort of flipped classroom that you mentioned is absolutely the way to go because you can present that dense information online and then come in and have a much more interactive session with students. Whereas if what you mm -hmm. want to do is something that's much more discursive to get students thinking, debating, then that technology is perhaps not appropriate. So it's just thinking about technologies as tools in our armory. Um, just the same as in our presentations here today. Some of us need, I needed pictures. If I didn't need pictures, I wouldn't have used slides. You know, it's, it's just using what you need. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the fees situation, I mean, to, to talk about Europe is a bit more difficult than talking about a single country because you're talking about a whole conglomeration of countries where there are different structures. Mm -hmm. But in most European countries, it's much more like Canada mm -hmm. in that the, are there are either no fees or fees are kept at very modest rates. The exception where we can really see the effect of fees is to look at the UK where um, fees were introduced to a cap of 9,000 pounds recently, and you can see the effect on student debt, and you can see the effect particularly on the kind of profile of students going to university, and there have been fall-offs in numbers, particularly among some cohorts of the population. So I think we have to be careful around the fees issue. Without fees, however, this is the situation in Ireland, the universities are in a situation where we're very dependent upon on state funding, mm -hmm. um, and state funding has been dropping, so we've had to find other ways to fund what we do. So it's a challenge. Well, indeed, there are quite a number of very interesting and explorative, uh, exploring questions, so let me go to the second one. Let me just uh, partially interpret what uh, the question was made, uh, from what the question was originally made. What this question says, Actually, it is from high school student. Ah. 
And what he argues is that, although many presidents are arguing that the universities have to change, he's, he's doubtful whether it will change as quickly as it should be. <laughs> <laughs> Especially since he's going to the university within the next couple of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Given that, universities will not be changing as much as we, you are an anticipating, is it fair to try to increase the percentage of the high school students going to university higher than it should be? In other words, is it fair for universities to monopolize all the high school graduates <laughs> in the following four years? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, who will respond to this challenge? I'll try. Okay, please. <coughs> We may not change as fast as people think we should, uh, but if you choose not to go to college or university, uh, you have chosen a path that it will be difficult to change from later when you figure out you've made a mistake. Um, it's becoming, uh, having an undergraduate experience uh, is simply becoming part of what is necessary to be a mem uh, um, an engaged member of your own society, uh, engaged in many ways, not only in the world of work, but uh, with your peers, your loved ones, and uh, your community. Um, so we may not change as fast as we would like. Mm -hmm. Certainly, I think that's going to be the case in the United States, but the other option is much worse. Right. President Young, yeah. would you please tell me that you are satisfied with the changes that you have made during the last four years? Yeah, there are a lot of yeah, challenges from the, our university faculty members, and <laughs> they don't want to change. <laughs> but you know that uh, we already mentioned that, uh, for example, uh, when I was in colleges, and the professors teach just reading their books in many cases and simply lecturing. But we are using slide in this day. Most professors are using slide in the PowerPoint. So this kind of changing is rapidly occurring in the campuses. And also, the tuition level is also, it should be uh, increasing. I, I mean, uh, for example, when I was at Stanford, I, the most impressive a course that I took was the independent study. The famous yeah, James Marsh, Professor James Marsh, I just met him uh, every other week and we discussed for one uh, hour uh, after reading several books uh, in advance. This kind of thing is a flipped class. And the, traditionally, professors teach in the classroom and the students do their homework at their home. But in these days, uh, students just uh, watch the, uh, just the video clips or the reading the books in advance and then mm -hmm. at the classroom they have to discuss and solve the problem. When I was in London uh, as a visiting professor and the, some professors in uh, UK professors mentioned that uh, some of them are the graduate of the Oxford and uh, just the Cambridge. Uh, they, they just mentioned that in this way. All the other university is not real university. <laughs> so I, I, I said, oh, <laughs> what, what do you mean? And the still, they keep the system of the tutorship. Tutorship is the real university. As you mentioned, that the first age is the scholar. Mm -hmm. To raise the scholar, they just utilize tutorship. This kind of a massive, mass education is not enough. You know that the education means started from the educe. Educe means that uh, pulling out of the body, it means that uh, their, from their talent, we just uh, uh, strengthen their ability. But in Korea, we are just pouring into the knowledge, into the body. It is, it is education, but it's not true. Mm -hmm. So if we just pulling out our talent, and then we need more face-to-face -face, uh, interaction with the professors or teaching fellows, then it means that the mass education is very, very, just a yeah, uh, cheap education method. But in the uh, more face-to-face -face and uh, real education, we need more money 
more just like resources and the professors, yeah, interactive one is yeah, necessary. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you, you, you just mentioned that the, this kind of challenges, it is very difficult to change. For example, I tried several other things in my university as well, but there are a lot of uh, conflicts. For example, in the late 19th century, uh, we are around 40 or 50 years behind of the uh, Japanese uh, modernization. The reason is, uh, up to the late 19th century, we still think that scholarly work is the Confucianism. That is all. But my university started from the law and the commerce. It means that it is, uh, at that time, many scholars think that it is not a, uh, just like a scholarly work. But, at the moment, in the 21st century, we have to change our system. We have to change our university. We can get any information from other uh, ways. So the, at the university, we need to just uh, strengthen the muscles, how to make our own knowledge and information in the university. Vice President Moresh? I, I think if you want to ask you know, how quickly universities change, you, what you've just raised, there's a really interesting point, is that uh, universities are still coming to terms with the idea of mass education. That the kind of mass education that really has been feature in most educational systems since the middle of the 20th century is something we are still trying to figure out how to do. How do you lecture effectively to a room of 500 people? Okay. We're still trying to work that one out. So, I mean, I, I think asking how we adapt to things that are only just happening that we haven't quite understood mm -hmm. is, is, you know, is, is very optimistic to think All we're right. going to change in the next four years sure. where we haven't changed in the last 60 mm -hmm. in some respects. Well, the third question is more challenging than before. <laughs> <laughs> than the previous one, that is that uh, with today's cha changing technologies that the universities have not anticipated, it seems that many of the universities are choosing to be simply fast followers rather than the leading changes for the industries to come. Mm -hmm. It seems to be more pessimistic than you are. <laughs> and then, then the following statement is that, in this situation, I wonder whether the traditional degree programs that universities are offering should continue. Mm -hmm. You want me to answer that? Why not? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the 1920s, uh, Clark University in the United States tried to offer a three-year degree program three-year bachelor's program. It, wasn't, it was just three years and we we're going to get a BA. It didn't work. Um, the inertia, um, the way credentials are looked at, <coughs> means that it's going to be very difficult to move any of those already established markers. Um, it would be nice to come up with a, a different way. So there's a place in the United States called Western Governors University and it's competency-based. It has a whole series of competencies that you're supposed to master, et cetera. Uh, sounds like a wonderful model. Recently, the US Department of Education cited them for failure to engage their own students uh, in one-on-one -on -one, uh, uh, dialogue mm -hmm. as they did this competency-based education or attempted it. So it looks like, that doesn't look like a, a real possibility uh, right at the moment, uh, it seems to me. Where it's one thing, you had mentioned it, things, uh, as new things come along, they don't eliminate old th other things. Just think about your keyboard. If it's in English, it's QWERTY. And the reason for a QWERTY keyboard was to slow people down, not to increase speed. Um, and it's go almost going to be impossible to replace the QWERTY keyboard because that's what everyone learns on. The, the costs are too much. So one of the solutions uh, will be there will be gradually mo gradual change um, year by year by year if it's possible, if you have a structure that allows for it. Uh, and if you have a fluid enough structure with your faculty, 
uh, gradually um, those very inspiring teachers uh, will supplant uh, the ones who are less inspiring. Uh, and then what one needs to do is figure out a way not to have large lecture classes. Uh, and that's a difficulty because they're so, uh, they provide such yes. large amounts of revenue to the university. Mm -hmm. But if you can get away from those, you can do mass at a reasonable scale. Uh, so at SVA, the maximum class size in most classes is 20. Um, uh, we've got my colleague over there has probably the largest class in the school. Uh, it's 120. Yes. But, reading, but then he has three or four assistants too. Reading uh, between the lines uh, that he or she may have written, it seems that the university must change the way that traditional degree programs, such as four year long mm -hmm. under the program, may have to be shortened. Mm -hmm. For example, President Yum said mm -hmm. you are shortening from 15 weeks to eight weeks, and perhaps from eight to four weeks, four to yeah. two weeks, mm -hmm. nano degree, uh, micro degree. So these may be what this uh, person was asking if mm -hmm. the traditional universities mm -hmm. should follow what the leaders, maybe not the universities, but other institutions, mm -hmm. education institutions are doing. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know that in the United States, just like uh, alternative universities are yes. just a, uh, uh, emerging, just like uh, all in college or the singularity universities, the Minerva University, uh, it is very difficult to enter that university, more difficult uh, than to enter Harvard or Stanford very highly competitive, but they're using traditional way of teaching. They're just uh, solving the problems and the project-based one. So from now on, diploma is not enough. Diploma, a certificate is not enough. And we need, it is a traditional way, 20th century legacy. In the 21st century, we are selecting the people not based on the diploma or certificate, but based on the real quality. Thanks to the development of the network system, and the, we can find very easily the talented person in the various uh, professional areas. So, mm -hmm. uh, you, the, the President Cho mentioned that the nano degree or the, the micro degree may be very popular from now on, and the alternative uh, higher education will emerge in the 21st century. So, the traditional uh, prestigious university uh, should not stay. Uh, simply just a uh, selling, not, not, not a good word, but just a uh, giving the diploma, and that is not enough. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. well, now we have only three minutes, and perhaps let me just uh, give you some of my learning from what you said. Well, first of all, uh, it seems that the future is brighter than what we expect, <laughs> because there are so <laughs> many interests in the audience, on the future, and as far as this interest stays, I believe that we will have to respond. And in our way of responding, I believe that we can find answers. Secondly, I believe that the world is becoming more diverse than before. Mm -hmm. And the demand will be from various corners of the world, which we may have never anticipated before. And I guess that is why there are more and more universities and they are like institutions. I was told just today, this morning, that in, the, in China only, there are about 2,500 universities, but probably it will grow to like 6,000. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that in every corner, the universities are growing in number. What that means is each of these universities is being created in response to this diverse uh, changes in the demand. And as far as oh, we, each of these institutions, universities, respond to such diverse mm -hmm. uh, uh, demands, then I'm sure that we will be able to provide more alternatives. And let the market dictate which forms may prove to be better suited for the future. And in that regard, 
you are the kings and queens who dictate what the university should be uh, moving toward. And for that, thank you very much, and thank you all.